This is IMRS Gulf Coast Branch, Houston, Texas. Welcome to viewers around the world and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Our speaker today is Rashid Kapadia. Rashid is an engineer, project manager, consultant, and author of Necessary Bridges, Storytelling and Public Speaking for Engineers and Project Managers. Initially, Rashid will speak for about 35 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. There will then follow a wrap-up session to the end. Kindly post your questions in the Q&A section and, pub and post them just before we start that section, please. Now, without further ado, I hand over to our speaker today, Rashid Kapadia. Thank you, Alan. Every person listening in has the potential to be a very good public speaker. Everyone watching this has the potential, perhaps yet untapped, to be as effective as the very best, as effective as this speaker. <clears throat> this is then President John F. Kennedy campaigning over 50 years ago, widely regarded as one of the greats, as a master of the craft. And today we will use him as a case study and as a competence model. To those of you who are thinking impossible, I can't, for now, tentatively, let me respond with this. It seems impossible until it gets done. Public speaking is a truly important skill to develop. Many a successful person has credited public speaking as a foundation to their success. This is Warren Buffett, a renowned investor. In the 2017 HBO documentary, Becoming Warren Buffett, he says, if I hadn't done the Dale Carnegie public speaking course, my whole life would have been different. This is past Prime Minister David Cameron and past President United States uh, Barack Obama. Both of them understood the power of public speaking. Both of them had prepared and they were relative unknowns when they were given an opportunity to speak at a political convention. And it is a convention speech <clears throat> which catapulted them on a voyage which took them to the very top. Now, here's a message for young engineers and young leaders. A chance will come when you will be asked to present. And the amount of preparation and passion you have for public speaking may well put you on a trajectory that would otherwise elude you. Since we are using Kennedy as a case study, here we can see, this is from a book, the similarities between Obama's and Kennedy's political trajectories is striking. Both of them came to national attention by delivering eloquent speeches at democratic conventions which preceded their nominations. It was an investment that was well worth their while. Kennedy was no stranger to the power of public speaking. Since we are using him as a case study, he was a journalist at the time of World War II and he witnessed some masterful speeches in parliament and he championed public speaking. He relished it and he wanted to be good in it. He committed to it. So today I have a mission for the next 50 to 60 minutes. The mission I have is one of persuasion. I hope you find motivation and inspiration, but that's not my focus. My focus is to persuade you to think differently to feel differently about public speaking and storytelling. And if you do that, to make a commitment, I will commit to excellence in public speaking, in storytelling. This is not a workshop on public speaking or storytelling. My name is Rashid Kapadia, and my life's voyage and circumstances placed me in two worlds, the world of engineering and project management, the world of public speaking and storytelling. And I found to my dismay that these two worlds are unnecessarily separated. How did I get into the world of engineering and project management? It's a fairly normal story for someone from my background and my age. I grew up in India in the 1960s and the 1970s. There was no such thing as the Indian dream, but if it existed, it went about something like this. Son, you can be anything you want, as long as it is a doctor or an engineer. Those were our only realistic choices. And we only the fortunate few could even get into these professions. So that's how I became a marine engineer. My voyage into the world of marine engineering started as an apprentice in a shipyard, Mazagon Docks. Here something unusual happened to me. 
I came from a relatively privileged advantage background, and I was working amongst people who did not have the same advantages. But the ingenuity with which they would solve problems was constantly blowing me away. I came to see engineering as a profession where you have to use your brains in a way I had never done before. Absolutely focused, disciplined, logical. <clears throat> and I just loved it. And besides, when you see a structure or a ship or a building, you just see it. But when you actually see it being built in front of you, step by step, you say, hey, anyone can do this. What happened is I came to love engineering, that focused, clear thinking to speak, to get engineering knowledge. And I came to champion engineering. I believe that if everyone can get an engineering like mindset, we can solve many, many more problems in the world than are currently being solved. And I also, I have to confess, I really, really wanted to be a very good engineer. I sailed for over 10 years on many ships. I made it to chief engineer, including these three ships. I sailed on these three ships. But then after a while, I began to realize that my son might grow up without really knowing me. So I started looking for something else. I started applying for colleges and I got admitted to Maine Maritime Academy, which is how I moved to the United States. And almost inevitably, for someone from my background, I became a project manager. This is how I ended up in the world of engineering and project management. How did I end up in the world of public speaking? This I believe is a more unusual and a more unique story. So I was a project manager in a company called Vatsala, and my boss told me, you have to get advanced certification in project management professional. He said, do what you must, go and get the certification. So I joined the Project Management Institute. And at the meeting, someone announced, we have a Toastmasters International sponsored club. Please consider joining. It's a public speaking club. And the minute I heard that, my mind drifted back to 1971. I was 11 years old and my late father, was a mesmerizing speaker. He was a leader in Rotary International. He would travel to many different towns and speak to clubs and sometimes he'd take us. I wish I could take you back to 1971. You would have heard my late father say something like this. In New Zealand, there is a tourist attraction. Visitors, they get into a boat, they are rowed into a cave. It gets darker, and darker until they are surrounded by a darkness like no other. Then the tour guide calls for silence. And in the pin drop silence, you see a tiny sparkle, a flicker of light, then tens, then hundreds, then thousands, tiny lights everywhere. These are fireflies, glowworms, and darkness is dispelled by light. And my father would tell his audience, you and I, we are like individual fireflies. When we turn on our lights, others do the same. Together, we dispel darkness. And with this, he would persuade the Rotarians to participate more in the charitable projects they were doing. Keeps coming back. Together, we dispel darkness. I have many memories from that era, but many strangers would come to my father and treat him with a lot of respect and a lot of affection. I remember thinking as a young boy, a seed being planted, this thing called oratory can be very powerful. And I remember feeling intensely connected to my father. I want to be like you. I want to speak like you. I'm so in awe of what you're doing. Because of that, that was, I think, when the seed of public speaking was planted in me and then deciding to join up was amongst the easiest decisions I've ever had to make. And same thing that happened with me with engineering began to happen with public speaking. I would walk into a room of strangers and through public speaking, we can all rapidly get connected by common ideas or common interests or common struggles or common humanity. I recognized it as a marvelous skill to, to, to possess. I came to champion it. I, everyone, give it a try, give it a try. See if it can help you. And I have to make a confession. I was so hooked. I really, really wanted to become a very good speaker. That is how I ended up in the world of public speaking and storytelling. 
So here I am in two worlds, unnecessarily separated, and I gave myself a task. What can I do to bridge these two worlds? It became a research project. It became a labor of love. It became a book where I hope I can persuade people to commit to this necessary skill. Some of memories from my childhood, from my young culture, we were always kind of implied, taught that you're an ambassador for more than just yourself. For instance, when I was in school, I would get into a lot of trouble, but I knew I couldn't cross a certain line which would disgrace my family because I'm an ambassador for my family. I remember when I was sailing on ships, it's when I used to go ashore abroad, I had this feeling that no one knew I was from another country, but I had to hold up a certain standard because I was representing my country for a very short while. I felt this with both my professions, especially when I'm in outside group, so to speak. I'm an ambassador for the pro profession of engineering. I'm an ambassador for the profession of project management. I have to represent our professions well. So now as an ambassador for public speaking, I am telling all of y'all, I want to give you an important message. Here it goes. Public speaking is going to be more important tomorrow than it is today. And this is not from me. This is from Chris Anderson, the leader at TED Talks, who in his book describes this as a talk renaissance. He says a talk renaissance is taking place right now. What does he mean by that? The initial renaissance was a bridge between the middle ages and modernity. And the catalyst, fundamental technology, which brought about that change was the printing press. Suddenly, knowledge could be disseminated in a way that it could never be done before. And that is what brought about change. And he argues that now, instead of a printing press, this combination of a speaker, speaker audience, and an ability to distribute it widely is what the talk renaissance is all about. He gives an example, over a billion views every year of TED and TEDx talks. People are hungry to get knowledge, not just through reading, but also through listening to a speaker. Here's an example of that viral dissemination. Julian Treasure, he gave a TED talk, how to speak so that people want to listen. Same topic that we're discussing. And perhaps 2000 people saw him live. And yet I checked a few days ago, between TED and YouTube alone, he's got more than 73 million views. This is a new way of spreading knowledge an ability to speak well, eloquently, persuasively, professionally. So I have a core message for you today. Core message, here goes. Every Amarset engineer or leader can be a better engineer and leader by building a foundation, a skill of public speaking and storytelling and a better ambassador for your professions and your organizations too. This is one of the most important slides in my presentation. Sometimes you're asked, reduce your presentation to one slide. This would be the one slide I choose, or one of the few. Every one of you can be better at your jobs and a representative of your profession by being a better public speaker and storyteller. So remind you, my mission now is to persuade you. It is to persuade you. I must think differently and feel differently about public speaking and storytelling. I must commit to excellence. I mean excellence in public speaking and storytelling. So as an ambassador, I will share with you what I have learned. I want to repeat, this is not a workshop. This is just some lessons I picked up along the way. You will learn different lessons if you commit to this voyage. But the top three lessons I learned go like this. Acknowledge, embrace the power of emotions. The fear of public speaking, which is what stops most people, is not at all sensibly understood. And public speaking and storytelling, they can create immense connection between strangers. These are some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Lesson number one, acknowledge and embrace the power of emotions. Now, when I grew up, even right from school and college, we were skeptical of emotions. We, I considered a person who takes emotional decisions to be uneducated or not balanced and rational. That's the way we grew up. So I would view the world something like this, especially when I was in a leadership position or I was responsible for money. All my decisions must be taken rationally. Gold medal for rationality, silver medal for rationality. Occasionally you have to handle the emotional uh, dramatics that life throws you. But this was my worldview. You know, be neurotically rational, be neurotically rational. <laughs> That's just the way we grew up. And then when I started speaking in Toastmasters, I would speak about topics that interested me, new technologies, climate change. And I realized that I was creating and generating an emotional wasteland. Nothing of 
power that like I saw between my father and Rotarians was happening. And I knew that I'm missing the boat. I have to do something differently. It's not just about transferring knowledge. And I slowly came to realize that people's emotions are driving their decisions to pay attention or not to pay attention. If they're bored, I've lost them. And even more, emotions form memories. So the concept of honoring emotions and building them into public speaking began to dawn in my mind. I decided I have to start again. Just let me put aside everything else and start again. And first, when you're speaking, have an emotional connection, some common interest, some common hunger, some common struggle, have a connection, then rationality, content, substance, and then finally close with that connection again. I can't stress, rationality is very important, content is very important, style, you know, just emotional drama without substance is awful. So the meat of your speech must be clear, the good ideas, the knowledge, but it has to be sandwiched with a sense that we are all in this together. That is from where the engagement and the power of public speaking comes. To sum this up, people are not going to remember what you said. People remember the way you made them feel. And I've asked people, they said, I saw your speech last year. It was really good. I said, what do you remember? And they remember almost nothing. They might remember my father's firefly story or something along those lines. Now I want to talk about another time when I remember being very emotionally involved, uh, being engaged. It's a scene from a movie called Invictus. It's a very basic scene. The president of, the, of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, calls the captain of the rugby team. He wants them to win the World Cup to unite the nation. So he sets about having a conversation between former enemies. And that's all it is, a conversation between two people. So he sits Francois down. Francois Pinard is the captain of the rugby team. He sits him down in his office and asks him, tell me, Francois, what is your philosophy on leadership? How do you inspire your team to do their best? And Francois Pinard replies, by example, I've always thought to lead by example. Mandela, that is right. That is exactly right. But how are you going to get your team to be better than they think they can be? That is very difficult, I find. Inspiration, perhaps. How will you inspire everyone around you to greatness? How can we inspire ourselves to greatness when nothing less will do? How can we inspire everyone around us? And he says, I sometimes think it is when we use the work of others. He talks about a poem, Invictus. And he said, I remember when I was in jail, that poem helped me to stand when all I wanted to do was to lie down. I drew inspiration from it. He talks about going to the Olympics in Barcelona in 1992. And he tells the captain, at that time, the future of our country looked very bleak. But I heard people from all over the world singing a South African song. And it made me feel so proud to be a South African. It inspired me, go home and come home and do better. And it allowed me to expect more from myself. And then he turns on his persuasion. He tells the captain, we need inspiration, Francois, because in order to rebuild our country, all of us, we must exceed our own expectations. <laughs> now, this scene moved me very deeply, had the kind of same impact on my memory like my father's uh, 1971 talks. And I remember thinking clearly, I want this emotional climate for my teams. I want to work for a boss who can inspire like this. I would like to be a team leader who can inspire like this. So what is going on? What is it about the scene? And I'm trying to put on my engineering mind and figure it out. Let me be a detective. What do I have to do? What must I understand about this? And I watched the scene again and again. And I thought, is it the voice? Is it the vocal variety? Is it the camera angles? Is it the words? And I still wasn't finding a satisfactory answer until it hit home. This is storytelling. This is the power of storytelling, which was a skill I had been completely dismissive of. We are drawn to stories. That is why for as long as you can look back, movies, plays, they draw us in because storytelling captures our emotions and that drives our decisions and our memories. And it's not just Hollywood. Even the, some of the greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg, they are masterful storytellers. They have understood that the way to reach others, one of the tools in your toolkit is storytelling. 
So I had to reach this conclusion. Instead of saying emotions are not for me, I have to honor my emotions and let them speak to me. Now, this is very different from artful flattery or being emotionally manipulative. We are not at all talking about that. Just acknowledge I'm a human being. I have emotions and I honor them and allow them to speak to me when I'm dealing with others. Which brings me to the end of my first lesson. Acknowledge and embrace the power of emotions, but don't be manipulative. You know, it can be very powerful. Emotions have to be decent. You have to use it as a skill to make points hit home. Lesson number two, and this I believe is probably relevant for most people in our audience. The fear of public speaking is not sensibly understood. There's a lot of fear associated with it. And the minute someone like me encourages you to do it, you will come up with some reason not to do it because of this fear. We've come across statements like this very often. The fear of public speaking is considered to be greater than the fear of death. And I just, I don't know, I, I'm nonsense. You know, this is just, I'm sorry, this is nonsense. And so when I speak to audiences, especially when I had the live audiences, I would ask all of them, is there anyone in this room, just any one of you who's more afraid of public speaking than death? This is my survey. And no one has ever put their hands up. And if I ask you, listener, right now, you, you cannot, in, you know, with, with, with good decision making and judgment and say that you're more afraid of public speaking than death. It's not. It's just a, it's an unnecessary myth. So if you keep hearing the statement, Here's what I request of you. Just, just say, not true. Let me put it aside. I've heard this before. I don't want to discuss this anymore. It's out of the way. So how to proceed? First, acknowledge it is real. It is common. So where does it come from? Let's go to the very first principles. And I keep saying first principle. I found when I was doing naval architecture, electricity, even way back physics in school, when I would get stuck at a problem, I would go back. What are the first principles from which I can derive solutions? And I found it to be a very, very good way to work. So what are the first principles of the fear of public speaking? They are sensations in your body. It's called glossophobia. I think that's Greek for the, your tongue getting frozen or some such thing. But always, always, always the fear of public speaking is sensations in your body. Your face will get flushed. Your tongue will get swollen. Your throat will get dry. All of this has happened to me. Probably some of this has happened to you some of the time. You feel a breathlessness. A pounding chest. Pounding chest is quite common for me. The stomach gets tied up in knots. You just feel. And this happens when I was driving for. It wouldn't happen so much for me on site. But when I was driving to a place where I had to give it. My stomach would be churning all the time. Sweaty. Clammy palms. It's quite common. Though not for me. Not so much. Rigid shaking hands and hands and knees. This has happened more times than I care to accept, especially when I was in college or I hadn't spoken for a long time, my whole knees would start shaking and I was wondering what's happening. Here's what I want to say, only this and nothing more. That's it. Some sensations come in your body and they are temporary, they will go away. This is a very kind of logical, sensible, balanced way and a foundational way to understand what is happening with the fear of public speaking. So what do you do when these sensations arise? I say deliberately, you activate some positivity technique. All right, I'm having anxiety. What can I do to change my state? What do I mean by a positivity technique? So let's take a look at the X axis and anything above that is high energy. Anything below that is low energy. The Y axis, anything to the left of it is negative energy. Anything to the right of it is positive energy. Two by two matrix. High energy, negative energy, I'm anxious. High energy, positive energy, I am excited. Likewise, low energy, positive, I'm calm. And low energy, negative, discontentment. This small graphic is the story of our lives. From birth to death, we are always in one of these four quadrants. Something happens to us in public speaking and we become anxious. Let's just put it aside. It comes from evolutionary biology. It comes from systems within a sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, HPA axis. There's plenty of proof to tell us that this is an embodied thing that is in us as an evolutionary bequest. A positive technique is anything that can deliberately move you from anxious to excited or anxious to calm. That's it. That's a positive technique. I'm feeling anxious, activate. It. All I have to do is, okay, I'm feeling anxious. How can I change my state? So each of us is different. Develop your own arsenal of positivity techniques. Notice, okay, I'm anxious. 
I listen to a song, anxiety has gone. I, I say a poem, anxiety has gone. I do some exercises, anxiety has gone. I breathe, anxiety has gone. Develop your own techniques. And it's not just for public speaking. It's for anything in life where stress, you want to focus at work. Develop your own arsenal of positivity techniques. One of the most standard is breathe deeply, low and slow. This is biology. If you breathe sleepy, deeply, your SNS will get deactivated and your PNS will get activated. And you will, you will move from anxious to calm. The moment you're feeling anxious, breathe deeply, low and slow, and you will become calm. This is for anyone everywhere. I'll tell you one of my favorites is to observe the sensations objectively, almost like I'm a scientist or a doctor trying to make a report. All right, I'm feeling a little tingle out here. I'm feeling a little pulsation here. It's a little stiffness here and just watch it and it goes away. It really works well for me. Just observe yourself almost like you're a doctor trying to give yourself a report of what's happening in your body. Another technique is called relabeling. It sounds very mundane, but there is a lot of scientific literature behind this. So my mind is full, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling anxious. Just stop thinking that and say, I'm feeling excited, I'm feeling excited, I'm feeling excited. There are videos, there are science papers, HBR articles. I mean, there's more than enough validating this as a common experience. And this is even quicker than breathing. Because when you're doing deep breathing, you're switching across two phases, across the Y axis and across the X axis. While this is even quicker, I'm feeling excited. I'm feeling excited. And you can rapidly feel a change of state. Now, for me, what has always worked is some combination of sports or music. If I just do some physical exercise or I watch a sports video or I listen to a song that I've got programmed, like that, my, change, my state has changed. It's so easy and so effortless to do. It's almost tragic, dare I say criminal, not to have your own arsenal so that you can move from anxiety and perform your best whether it's public speaking or anything else. Now, here's one of my favorites. She was a very famous lady, first lady of American theater, but she used to always feel nervous. Fear is not a foe, but a friend. That's relabeling. And I do this all the time. Come on, you're my friend. Thank you for showing up. This is a reminder. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Moment you start feeling anxious, it could be about public speaking. It could be a difficult job at work. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Anxiety, thank you for showing up. You're a friend, you're reminding me to prepare, nagging me to do my best. It's just changing the way you think about fear. So let's put it this way, glossophobia. Fear of public speaking, it is real, it is common. Put this aside the moment you hear someone saying, this, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Look at it this way. It is an inevitable bridge that all of us have to cross. Develop your own arsenal of positivity techniques. And there is no reason why you can't prevail over something that is universal and has been around in our ancestors and way before we were humans. Are, this has been inside all of us. So the fear of public speaking is not sensibly understood. And as engineers, I think we can push each other more to be sensible, to be rational, to figure out what's really happening inside this engine inside of us. Time for lesson number three. Public speaking and storytelling are connection enablers. This was serendipitously one of the best experiences I had in public speaking. One I was not expecting. One I, I can't tell you how uplifting it is that when you're speaking to others, you start off as strangers and suddenly you feel that you're completely connected to each other. What is connection? Connection is one of the most ineffable, the most visceral, the most non-measurable of all the experiences I have had when speaking to people in audiences. It's almost like there's some kind of neural resonance that is taking place. It has to be rooted in science. I believe that this is programmed, this neural science is programmed into us from an evolutionary basis a long time ago, which made our species very successful, the way we can connect with one another. But I remember this coming to life when I was doing a Toastmasters project called the oratorical speech. You have to take a famous speech by someone and you have to try to give it being that person's personality. And I decided to do John F. Kennedy's inaugural address, a small segment of it. But I had just read a technique called how to connect. He says, you never make a single statement to an audience without looking at someone. So I put my notes aside. I said, I'm going to do this from memory. And I just gave it a try. I looked at someone we observed today. 
someone else. Not a victory of a party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning. Someone else signifying renewal as well as change. And I could feel something in the room changing. And I knew I had struck the mother load. This is where the power of public speaking comes. Like it's almost like brains are syncing up and we are all becoming one in terms of idea and what's happening inside of us. It's very, very powerful. So how can we connect with an audience? It's quite a deep topic. I'll just give you a few tips that might help. It's important to know that connecting with an audience is different from inspiring an audience or having an impact. They are all different skills. So we are talking about how to connect with an audience. To all of us feel like we are, we are in the same page. We are on message. We, we got the same goals. Your message is very important, but your commitment to your message and your relationship with your audience is more important. However much you believe in your message, however important your message is, the more committed you are, the more you connect with your audience and your relationship with your audience. I am here to serve you and to give you whatever knowledge I have. If I come to you with that relationship, I can connect more deeply with my audience. Develop a capacity to listen while speaking, constantly be looking at your audience. Who's tuned in, who's not tuned in? How can I reach someone else? This ability to receive their emotional state makes us all feel more connected to one another and to listen attentively with no agenda. This is so easy to say, it's so easy to say. It's hard to do, we all have an agenda, but you try it. The less of an agenda you have, the more your audience feels connected to you. The more you drive your agenda, the, the more they feel they're being maneuvered or manipulated or persuaded unwillingly. So an ability to hear your audience without any response, without getting angry or elated, the ability just to receive them as they are, very powerful for connection. And it's called uh, listen with soft and available eyes. Sometimes you can be very piercing with your eyes. You can make someone feel judged and afraid. But the other time you can just receive. It's almost like you throw away transmitter mode receive. This ability to listen to everyone, whether it's in public speaking or someone else, to receive with soft and available eyes is a concept I had never come across until I came across connection in public speaking. Learn how to receive your audience's attention as support. Whatever they're going through, someone might be you know, disagreeing with you. You might see an angry face. You might see a joyous face. It's all support. This is all valuable feedback. Each one of them is telling me what is going on with them and I must receive it as support. Forget about being good. Just be yourself. Forget about being good. If you're trying to impress someone, you won't connect with them. Nobody cares what you know until they know that you truly care about what we are discussing. That is the basis of connection in public speaking. It can create immense connection. That's what happened between my father and Rotarians way back 1971, as I remember it. That's what happened between a captain and a president that had to rebuild a country. Felt deeply connected to one another. Public speaking and storytelling can create immense connection. This brings me to the end of the third big lesson I learned on my public speaking voyage. So let's summarize, where have we been? Every one of you, can be a better engineer and a better representative of our profession and your organization by being a better public speaker and a storyteller. There's no debate here. There is a talk renaissance taking place right now. You ignore it at your own peril. Public speaking is going to be more important tomorrow than it is today. When speaking, honor your emotions and allow them to speak to you without engaging in artful manipulation. People are not going to remember what you said. They are going to remember the way you made them feel. If I ask someone, what do you remember of my talk? They might say, oh, I remember the Invictus scene. I remember the Firefly story. They might not remember much else, but they will felt, if they felt intensely connected and involved, that's what they will remember one year and two years down the road. Anxiety associated with public speaking, inevitable. Develop your own arsenal of positive techniques. It will help you not only in public speaking, but anytime you have to move at any work situation, in a con conflict situation, develop these skills that I can turn myself from negativity to positivity and understand that the connection, public speaking is an immense connection enabler. You can walk into a room as strangers and leave out, feel connected by common cause or interest or idea. So now my mission has been to persuade you. Think differently and feel differently about public speaking and storytelling. 
commit to excellence in public speaking and storytelling. And if this was a live audience, this is where I'd call them and say, please, 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 honestly tell me, have I accomplished my mission? But since we can't do that, I'm going to appeal to you to please try and give me some feedback. Just four sentences. One, was my mission accomplished? Yes or no, that's all. And if you would be so generous, what was most effective in my talk? What was least effective? And any other comment? Any other comment will be most helpful. And with this, for about 10 minutes, I can take some questions and I'm going to wait for Alan to come on. I hope you've been sending them to him. We should be getting good to go. Uh, thank you, Rashid. Uh, while we're waiting for questions to come through, um, I have a, a one that I'd like to ask you. I, was, uh, I love your quote from uh, Necessary Bridges. Uh, where you talk about the, making the decision to follow your calling and, and leave corporate life. Uh, you said uh, important decisions were made with, uh, often with insufficient insight, um, zero discussion and insufficient local information by remote newly minted bosses who I respectfully and kindly judge to be adequately capable and partially clueless. And that made me laugh. Uh, in today's world, many engineers may not have the choice and the decision about whether they stay or remain in the organization may be made for them, uh, particularly at these current times we live in now. What advice do you give to anyone who wants to follow their dream along the lines you were talking? Uh, <laughs> it's not really related to public speaking, but I would say in order to be in that situation, try and save as much as you can, you know, live frugally, because the world is changing so fast, so rapidly that we have no idea what's coming our way. So I would say advice in general is prepare for any future as best you can and develop as many skills as you can. And as you go from job to job to job, it is more the skills associated with the liberal arts, the ability to learn new, the ability to write well, the ability to speak well, the ability to learn different subjects that will carry you more than the engineering we learned in school, which becomes obsolete very fast. And I must uh, confess to you, Alan, the, I'm <laughs> impressed that you picked up that part. That's also from the movie Invictus when, the South African decided to get rid of the old national anthem and he tells them you have made a decision with insufficient foresight and he convinces them to work with their ex enemies it's, it's like, it's a marvelous scene. But yes, that is it. Hold on to your dreams, but you have to kind of constantly be having plans and especially given the pandemic and what changing with automation, you can't go wrong. I would say, not only your public speaking skills, but your one-on-one -on -one communication, your writing skills, your ability to relate to others, build that all the time. That will definitely help you. I hope that answered your question, Alan. You're muted. Uh, it, it did, thank you very much and very comprehensively. Um, I'm sorry, we've got grass cutters going on in the background here, wouldn't you know it? They haven't been here all week. Um, but uh, the second question, and I'm waiting for others to come through, and please, guys, do post your questions in the chat box in Slido if you have something you'd like to raise uh, for Rashid to answer. Uh, also in Necessary Bridges, Rashid, uh, you tell the story that to, um, of the female engineer who was given some uh, important feedback, uh, a female Chinese engineer, I think you said, uh, she was given some important feedback during an appraisal. Um, that to succeed in her employer's organization is rather like riding a bicycle. Uh, and you talked about, or she, you explained that where the back wheel is the engine, the technical part, technically driven, and the front wheel requires uh, leadership and communication. And uh, so taking that, that story, what's, what is the advice that you might give to those of us uh, that have a strong back wheel, but need development of the front wheel. Oh, <laughs> I'm odd that you remember. The lady's name, the girl's name is Leanne. Leanne Pinto. I remember she just gave a speech in a Toastmasters club where she said all this. And then I said, I need to interview you. Please just tell me this because this is awesome. She had just come from China and she was extremely skilled at the technical aspect. But her appraisal said, listen, you know, you're just, you. if you want to go this step, forget about... Uh, you're good enough in accounting. 
learn how to deal with other people, learn how to speak well. That's why she joined Toastmasters. I mean, it's almost perfect. If you know that you're very strong on the technical, or I will say the individual contributor side, but you want to do more than just be an individual contributor, then it's just fundamental communication and relationship skill. You can't go long, wrong improving them on a day by day by day basis. That is what I would say to you. Uh, build a bridge between two worlds. It's a necessary bridge. Okay. Um, thank you, Rashid. I, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, we've had a, a question from Stephen um, who said, who asks, when I speak to strangers, I often lose my thoughts and words. What can I do? Uh, he I hope, Stephen, thank you, you're an engineer. I hope you did. I've got a full segment on my website which basically deals with understanding grossophobia like an engineer. But to answer your question, develop your own set of positivity techniques. What's happening is you're having an anxiety attack. Understand that this is an internal process and there are different ways. It's almost like you have to upgrade the algorithm from childhood the algorithm says, stranger comes, be afraid, be afraid. So what works for me is I am anxious, your attention is inward. It's not about me, just how can I make a contribution to this person? How can I engage with this person? If you make a fool of yourself, so what? Someone will laugh at you. That's the worst thing that will happen. And uh, change your focus. I'm engaging with them. Have they asked me a question? Can I really explain this to them in a way that works for them? Am I able to make some contribution to them? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a, another question. Thank you for that, Rashid, uh, from Clive. Uh, thanks, Rashid, for the great talk. If someone starts to stutter or forget the script, what tips do you have to get out of the panic? It's the same thing, developing a set of positivity techniques. But forget about being good. Panic is, some, is a state. It's brought on by HPAA and SNS. I mean, just read up a little bit on that. What tips I have is just make an effort to contribute, but I want to, there's a TED talk. I think I've referred to it in my book also. I can't remember her name right now. She's an Australian musician and she gave the full talk while stuttering. And what you realize is whether you stutter or not, it really doesn't matter that much. What matters is your intention of communicating. People are extremely tolerant. People are actually greatly admire you. I remember being deeply moved by watching that TED talk thinking, would I have the guts to do that? And she, she talks a lot about stuttering and stammering, but somewhere between stuttering and anxiety, look at it as an internal problem. And if I can just take my focus on how can I help this person? How can I contribute? Uh, you will be able to ride it out. The key is not necessarily to overcome anxiety, but to be able to make a contribution, whether you're anxious or not. Go ahead, Alan. Okay. Thank, thank you, Rashid. We've got quite a few questions coming through now. So I'll, I'll, uh, let's try and get the answer them as quickly as we can. Um, uh, from someone who doesn't give their name, have you got any recommendations for listening and responding to the audience in brackets reading the room while speaking when speaking online? Uh, when speaking online, it's really quite difficult. If I can, like, for instance, now I can see Alan's face and it's making such a difference to me while everyone else is blank. So what the way I handle it is if I have the luxury of seeing your face I can read not, if not, stay on mission. The mission is to, in this case, persuade you. So stay on mission when you can't get feedback. If you can see their faces, the usual face reading and body language techniques. Okay, thank you. Um, from Francis, uh, do you have any advice on how best to structure or deliver the rational part when speaking as an engineer whilst retaining the emotional connection? Yes, I would say, take this in mind, tell a story, make a point. Is the, it's been the time-tested golden rule of public speaking. Use an analogy, make a point. Use a metaphor, make a point. So when you're making an engineering argument, try to tell a story or use a prototype. For example, recently I was reading uh, a book on some, he says that our consciousness, the way we relate to each other, Think of it like a computer screen. What's happening on a computer screen is really a reflection of zeros and ones in the computer. Likewise, this is an analogy. Likewise, inside of us, there are zeros and ones which drive our decisions. Go ahead. Okay. I think we've got time for possibly one or maybe two more. 
uh, an anonymous person asks, what happens if your message is not what the audience wants to hear? Uh, good question. I mean, does this mean it's of no interest to them or does it mean like it's a politically opposite question? You have to decide why you want to speak. And now, for example, if I had to go to a people who are learning poetry and I have to talk engineering, I would have to somehow try to find a way of making it interesting for them. On the other hand, when it's a conflict related, they don't want to hear that this party is good or that party is bad. At that point, you have to check your own interest and ask them, is this a worthwhile endeavor? You know, I, there's this famous thing, there should be three gatekeepers for your tongue. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? If you feel you can manage that, go for it. Okay. Um, the, finally, the last question, Rashid, uh, is it necessary to use body language in a formal institutional platform? Uh, how can I connect my theme with public expectation while presenting? Uh, I, I don't know, except that I know that body language is just built into the way we are. I would say just allow yourself to get into the zone, let your body do what it does. Some people have stiff body language. Some people are like, uh, like generals. If you watch masterful politicians like Bill Clinton and just put off them, you'll see his body is always moving. So our body is part of our communication system. Don't use it manipulatively. Don't try to develop it too much. Just focus on your message. And if my hands are moving, I for one, I just can't stand still. So okay. uh, if you do want to utilize it, don't do it manipulatively. Just read up something on body language and then forget about it when you're presenting. Okay, thank you, Rashid. I think we'll, any further questions, we'll treat them separately and offline uh, okay. later, but now uh, I, I give it back to you for, for closing. Okay, so screen share, let's hope it's smoother this time than last time. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to close with what is called a prototype closing. Some time ago, I read this article, the best public speakers according to the internet. And so this is a site where they discuss public speaking and they track the number of views, et cetera, to decide what is the public watching. And a person called Guy Kawasaki was rated as number one. Interesting to note, he's a business personality as opposed to a politician or a motivational speaker. So one more reason to know that he would not have been the success he has had he not been such an effective public speaker. And I recall having listened to many of his talks, very engaging, no necess unnecessary dramatics. He's really got good substance, but you feel connected to him. But I remember him talking to, uh, I saw some students, there was some kind of contest going on. And he said, even though public speaking is very important, focus on a prototype more than on a pitch, which is in almost in contrast to what I'm saying. So what you can try to do is to build in a prototype whenever you're speaking. If you look at any of the Apple product launches, they will always show you the product. They will show you someone doing it. Try to prototype as much as you can. So that is what I want to try to do now. I want to see if I can build in a prototype closing by showing you, making you feel the power of public speaking. So I'll do that same speech, the uh, oratorical speech, as I did in the Toastmasters Club. I'm going to give myself three tasks. I have to honor my emotions and I let them speak to me. I have to manage anxiety. It comes, it just comes all the time. And I have to connect with everyone, which is harder for me to do in this virtual environment. But you have one task. Ask yourself, will I be a better engineer? Will I be a better leader if I can become a better public speaker and storyteller? So the prototype is one of the most famous speeches in American, uh, especially 20th century American history. The country is supposed to, said to have passed through a membrane. Lots and lots and lots of young people reconnected with their nation again. It's a 14 minute speech. We'll do five minutes. I'll do two and a half minutes. President Kennedy will do two and a half minutes. It's worth reading this. He was so committed that he kept using a coach right up to the end. Through his campaigning, he was always trying to get better. So that's keeping in, keep that in mind when you see his ringing delivery. So here goes, uh, now, if I was in a live audience at this point, I would put on a coat and I'd joke a little bit. It's time for me to feel presidential. Then I'd try to drop into the zone and start. One, two, three. We observe today, not a victory of a party, but a celebration of freedom. Symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. The world is very different now. 
For man holds in these mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that a torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and a bitter peace. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price and bear any burden to assure the survival and the success of liberty. To those nations that would make themselves our adversaries, we offer not a pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace before the dark powers of destruction unleashed by science engulf all of humanity in a planned or an accidental self-destruction. How can two great and powerful groups of nations take any comfort from our present course? Both sides are overburdened by the cost of modern weapons. Both sides are rightly alarmed by the steady spread of the deadly atom. So let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. Now the trumpet summons us again. Not as a call to battle, though in battle we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out. Now, I want to stress to all of you, all, this was not about the greatness of John F. Kennedy, though greatness of plenty he had and he was committed to excellence. This is a prototype. It's just a demonstration of a skill that is available easily to any of us, anyone. But part of John F. Kennedy's legacy is this. Every president can be a better president by being a better public story, a public speaker and a better storyteller. And by extension, all of us, engineers, leaders in our profession, we can be better at what we do by being better at communicating, at public speaking, at storytelling. And I have to remind you, whether you acknowledge it or not, whether you accept it or not, you are a representative of I'm Arrest. And the world says to all of us, we need you to be an inspiring person. Sometimes our futures look bleak. Sometimes we have immense problems to solve. And as engineers, we can be inspiring because we have to continue to build 
We have to expect more from ourselves. And we have to represent our professions for the greatness that they truly have. Every one of you can aspire to excellence in public speaking and storytelling. Every one of you has the potential to be as effective as the very best of the best. It always seems impossible until you get it done. Thank you, Alan, over to you. Thank you and uh, viewers around the world. We look forward to you joining us in the future. Have a great day and bye-bye.